Hi, and uh, welcome to the next episode of The Breakpoint, Breakpoint number four. I am Paul Irish. Adi Asmani is joining us in London, and we will be uh, doing a tour of the timeline. Uh, the timeline is part of the Chrome DevTools uh, to help give you a great view of the overall performance of the application uh, from start to finish, including all the parts. Uh, and so it really gives you this really nice a uh, holistic view of how your application is performing, so you can dig into the pieces that are giving you bottlenecks, uh, whether they're JavaScript, paint times, reflows, uh, or anything else. And we can help identify what's ex exactly slowing our app down um, and, and fix it. So we're going to dive into uh, how to use it, um, the kinds of insights that it shows. Um, and generally, uh, you should be able to walk away from this uh, with a much better understanding of how browser internals work, how it interprets your page, uh, and what you can do to make sure your app uh, loads and interacts as fast as possible. All right. <coughs> so uh, first things first, let me uh, bring this up. So inside uh, the Chrome DevTools, we have the timeline. It's about the uh, fifth tab over. Um, and it's giving you this overall view. Um, one of the things that we have um, in there is a uh, is a events view. And this is something that has been in there for quite some time. So I'm going to do a sm small little demo on how this comes into practice. Uh, I have up here the New York Times skimmer, a really well done web application done by the New York Times um, to show today's news and such. So I'm going to bring up the timeline. And it looks like I'm going to have to wait for the page to kind of refresh here. There we go. That looks good. Now, I want to record a new, uh, a new session. So I can hit this Record button. I can also hit Command-E. It's a lot easier. I'm just going to refresh the page first. And now I'm going to scroll to some other sections. There we go. And I'll open this story and close this story. So that's pretty good. I'll stop this with Command-E. And so down here, we have a, uh, this is the full timeline. Um, we can drill into a certain area up the top by just clicking and scrolling. Um, you, we can also, with the trackpad, do a few little gestures to kind of zoom in on the area. So we can go up um, by scrolling up, and we can kind of narrow our focus here. We can also scroll to the side and uh, pan between them. And you can see all the events are updating on the bottom. Um, <clears throat> the other thing to orient yourself is uh, very kind of small here, but we have a small blue line and a red line. And these refer to DOM content loaded and, um, and the window.load event. So uh, let's take a look and see kind of what's going on. The first thing that we have up here is uh, the blue level. And so this is all network activity. Underneath this is yellow JavaScript uh, execution. It's happening all the time. Um, and then the last is kind of rendering and screen layer, so um, paint and rendering, uh, purple and green, and I'll share this third thing here. Um, and so I think I refreshed the page right around this area, um, and you know things were happening. But well, one of this, when, while this does tell me kind of the interaction between the layers of the browser as it loads the page, it doesn't really give me a good view of what was slow about anything. It doesn't give me any good recommendations, and I can look down and kind of see for all these events how long they took, and uh, see the general waterfall of events as they trickle over. Um, but uh, over this course of a 10-second recording, I don't have a good idea about where to target. So to do that, I'm going to switch over to the new frames mode. So I can switch over to frames mode. Now this gives me a little bit different of a view. Um, one of the things in frames view is over here on the right-hand side, um, we have these measures. So the height of each bar in frames view refers to the length of time that it took to complete that frame and send it up to the screen. And so uh, something that takes a short amount of time, we can send up to the GPU really quickly. And this means that we can keep the refresh rate as fast as possible. In most cases, you want to target a 60 FPS frame rate. Um, but some uh, high-end monitors run at 120 hertz, and so uh, the, brow the browser will actually be trying to send 120 updates per second to those monitors. Um, phones 
uh, might have a 55 uh, hertz refresh rate. Uh, so 60 is kind of a, a general guideline. Uh, most machines and devices uh, refresh at that rate. Um, so you could target that. But once we have these very long bars, then that means that our frame rate is dipping below, uh, below 30 FPS. And that's not good. So we want to identify what we can do to make that faster. So let's see. We're going we're gonna to take a look in here. And I'm just going to, uh, it looks like I might have found a small bug in Canary today. I'm going to try refreshing this page and restarting a timeline recording. Oh, this doesn't look good. There we go. What do you think, Addy? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see. This is one of the very few times that, uh, that using Canary might go a little. As you can see, sad. I do have a Canary update just waiting for me here. This is fine. I can, I can, we can, we can adapt to this situation here. Okay, I'm going to jump over to a, a fresh Chromium build that I have. Uh, that's good. And well, this is the breakpoint, so things break in real time. That's right? <laughs> exactly what happens. So I think the viewers get it. All right, good. I'm glad. <laughs> All right, now we should be good here. Yeah, this is looking pretty sharp. Nice. We're going to scroll up to this page. Wow, it does look, oh, I have not saved anything. So, OK, good. And I'll open up this story uh, or not. All right. So now we've uh, navigated around. We've recorded its timeline. If I zoom in on the DevTools, you can just Command plus to always do that. Um, we have a look. And so, like I said, any tall bar gives us an indication that things are not running as smooth as possible. Um, this is, especially when I was navigating between these sections over here on the right-hand side, um, it took a little time for, for that transition to visually happen and for it just to complete. So I was sitting there kind of waiting a little bit. Um, so I want to find out what's going on. Um, my tab did crash, uh, and that's OK, because right now I'm just really interested in what's going on down at the bottom here. So if I scroll down a little bit, um, oh, my tab, my crash tab broke more things. Oh, this is, this is trouble. OK. All right. <clears throat> I think we're good now. Let's hope. All right. So now we have a timeline trace. Uh, the colors that I mentioned before still apply here. And so this frame, for instance, took 88 milliseconds. Uh, 88 milliseconds is a long time for a frame. If we're keeping with 60 FPS, then each frame is uh, a short 16.6 milliseconds. Um, that's our target. And when we take longer than that, then we're holding up the user um, from seeing their content quickly. So inside this 88 milliseconds frame, we have this long function call um, coming from solo source. And let's look into what's going on inside that. Uh, OK, so it looks like there's all these small parse events. Um, and there's a big, big waterfall of parsing. Now, parsing um, here in Timeline is just parsing HTML. Let me show exactly what, what's going on here. Um, now, I can hover over this and see actually a trace of why uh, we're now parsing. Um, and it looks like we're inside of uh, extend HTML. So um, this is probably the HTML method inside jQuery. Um, but it was initially called somewhere in the application source called uh, section layout markup, cache callback, handle response. 
So you can see the, the traversal from New York Times Skimmer or Colleen jQuery. Now the cool thing is I can click into here, and OK, yeah, it's, it's going to line 17 of, of jQuery, um, uh, a minified jQuery, not very useful to me. Now if I click the pretty print uh, to get a pretty print jQuery, and I come back the timeline, you see that my, uh, my line number here is now updated. So now I can actually click on line 2885, 2185, go to the new pretty printed line. And if I scroll over a little bit, you're going to see this uh, inner HTML setting. So here's exactly where the inner HTML on this element is being set. And that's why we're calling parse. Um, and it looks like what happened is uh, we had a succession of about f f f 60 or so um, uh, s sequential um, instantiations of the HTML5 parsing algorithm. Um, in total, it adds up to about yeah 62 milliseconds, um, which uh, took a decent amount of time. Now, let me see. I want to see if we can have, yes. So there was a small little hiccup here that we probably could have avoided. Now, if you see, um, so we're parsing HTML, parsing HTML. Then we recalc style here. Um, and then we parse some more. We recalc style, we lay out, and we paint. And so recalculation of style is just taking all the styles in the style sheets, in the browser's user agent style sheet, any inline styles. Um, d figuring out what the computed style of every DOM element on the page is um, against what the current DOM is. And now it looks like we have to do that twice, um, go back to parsing HTML, and then do that all over again. So uh, it's probably likely that we actually did not need to force this recalc style. The cool thing now is that we can just hover on recalc style, see exactly why these styles were, were necessary. So it looks like. Uh, the styles were both invalidated, and a recalculation was forced. And we can see why exactly this is happening now. So uh, the styles were invalidated because uh, on line 846, a class name was set. And any time a DOM changes, uh, then the current DOM is kind of discarded. We need to find out the new styles for that. Um, the other one is the style recalculation was forced here um, inside line 655, we ask for offset height. Um, and asking for offset height basically says, hold up, browser. I know you're busy, but I need this number, and it needs to be correct. So anything that you're doing, you need to pause um, and give me this number and make sure that it's correct. So even if you're asking for offset height, and then the second after you're setting some HTML, it's got to like freeze everything. Um, recalculate all the styles, which is going to pause the browser for a little bit, give you this number, and then it can continue on with the amount of work that it was doing. Um, so there's a few properties that do this. Um, the other place you can go to is Tony Gentlecore Trigger Layout. Um, Tony Gentlecore is an engineer on the Chrome team, and he has a, a great blog post on this where he just searched uh, the WebKit source for all the properties and methods that will force a reflow or a layout, um, which in turn forces styles to be recalced. So um, inside here is all of them, and uh, offset uh, height and offset width are in here as well. All right, Addy, is this making sense so far? Yeah, it looks good so far. All right, all right. <clears throat> We're going to keep going. So um, so what happened here is, is we asked for these offset heights. And then we went right back into uh, parsing our HTML. Um, we probably could have avoided um, these two pauses um, and just continued on. A lot of times, there will be a sequence of things where we're setting into the DOM, and then, uh, then you're requesting things like offset height, um, offset width, and then you go back to setting. And uh, a good way to speed up the page is to make sure you do sets in a row and then gets in a row. Um, so eventually, when we finish this big sequence, uh, we recalc style again. We lay it out. So we lay out the geometry of the page and how it's actually all the boxes are going to lay out. And then we paint. Um, and here, we can actually just see uh, a little overlay of the area that was painted. Um, and it's a little bit off because I was resizing uh, my dev tools. But um, 
the, the main content section uh, got painted, followed by the, the right navigation. Um, and so that was, that's just the story of that single frame being computed and being sent up to the GPU. <coughs> um, but this thing can happen a lot. So I want to look for something else. Uh, OK, here's another big frame at 60 milliseconds. Um, and here, instead of a lot of HTML parsing cost, we actually had a good amount of paint cost. And paint cost can be a little tricky to debug. Um, so here, we're just going to open up this guy and see what we have. All right, so this is pretty interesting. So this top area got painted. Um, and inside here, we have an, H, we have an image decode. Um, so these image decodes were actually added somewhat recently to the Chrome DevTools. Um, you'll, I don't think you'll see them in Stable, but you'll see them in Canary. And in this case, we were just taking a JPEG um, and uh, decoding it from JPEG into bitmap. And it took a good 20 milliseconds to do that. Uh, which is a surprisingly long time. Um, another thing that is essentially captured inside this paint, um, and, uh, and right now it's a small bug that we're fixing, um, is image resizing. So in this case, um, we had a lot of images that came in that, um, like let's say this one, a lot of the source images that were used in this application came in at their native size of 1024 pixels wide or 600 pixels wide. And they're just scaled to fit in the area where they should fit. Uh, now a lot of times this is necessary, and there's not much way you can get around it. But the actual cost of doing that resizing is something that uh, we're now able to see. Um, so typically, an image decode is always followed by an image resize. Um, and so, so Paul, is the uh, suggestion there that people use pre-scaled images? Yeah. that is um, that's pretty much the suggestion. If you can definitely serve up uh, images that are scaled to the correct resolution, um, the page is going to load a lot faster. And scrolling speed uh, is also going to be a lot faster, because images are decoded lazily based on when the user needs to see them. So we're not going to decode the entire page worth, even if none of it's visible. So it's going to really speed up scrolling um, and also speed up something like this. Um, the other thing I should mention is that in Chrome, Image decoding right now does operate on the main thread. So you know we have to wait for this image to decode before we can run any JavaScript, for instance. Um, that's the current state of things, although that's improving. And we actually expect um, image decodes to happen off thread uh, very soon, which is going to speed up things quite considerably. So serve, natively, serve images scaled to the resolution that you need them at, um, and watch this area. Um, now, it looks like, yeah, we painted this area up top. Um, and sometimes uh, with, a, uh, with a view that is not changing so much, we can actually keep track and, and identify which image it is and where it was located. Um, but in this case, uh, because the app has been moved around a bit, it's a bit trickier. So <coughs> overall, this is um, the way that we can diagnose what's going on with the application from a performance perspective and figure it out. And the thing that I also want to point out here is that in the past, when something operates pretty slow, um, people normally just dive into the Firebug profiler or the CPU profiler over here and just start recording and identifying JavaScript that is taking a long time. But what we end up seeing uh, in this timeline trace is that actually there's a lot of cost, um, a lot of the time that's taking the browser um, uh, a, a little bit of pause in delivering this content to the user is not JavaScript. And so I recommend to use the timeline to record a session of any slow interaction, then identify what's going on inside there. Maybe you do have really big yellow spikes. Um, but those yellow spikes might just be a bunch of HTML setting or something else. So this is a good way to identify where exactly your bottleneck is. Is it in script? Or is it just completely uh, in rendering costs? So uh, this is a good way to prioritize exactly what your performance costs are. All right, I think I got a pretty decent coverage on uh, I think you got some great coverage in there. On that. All right. Um, I wanted to see if there's anything else I should mention. No, no, I think that's good. Um, one thing I did want to show real quickly is a new experimental part 
um, that we're kind of playing with inside Chrome. And this is not yet available uh, for everyone, but we want to see what you guys think of it. Um, so I went through and, and looked at some of the properties that are normally a little bit slow, um, that can be slow in CSS. And I present this list with a lot of hesitation. Um, things that are slow now uh, may not be the things that are slow in the future. So do not take these as guidelines um, or advice on what to avoid. More just like this is a snapshot of the current present state. But the key here is to always test for yourself, because my bottlenecks are not your bottlenecks. So for instance, um, <coughs> box shadow is kind of known as something that's quite slow on desktop and on mobile. And I'm going to show you a little bit about how to actually see that now with this experimental feature. So I'm going to come over to uh, this little demo. And in this demo, as I scroll uh, the page, I have a few dancing Chrome logos. <coughs> but I can also add this checkbox, which adds in some CSS gradients in there um, and some box shadow. Now, if I record a timeline of this section, this page, and I make it dance a little bit, you can see that, let me narrow in that focus a little bit, you can see that I just have really long paint times. 25 milliseconds just to paint. Um, those are considerable. And, and I, I don't really have a good idea on you know, what is involved here. So what we can do, actually, to identify exactly what components are, are contributing to this longer paint time is we can turn on this new feature called Force Repainting. All right. So now it might be a little tough to see, but in the top right corner, I have both a, a meter that represents my current frames per second and also a, a rate of the, the paint rate. Um, and what this mode is actually doing is force repainting all the time. Tor normally, the browser only paints when it has to. Uh, but this mode just says, just keep painting, just keep painting. Because we want to be, be able to measure things, and we're going to change uh, we're going to change the situation. So, Paul, if, if you're constantly repeating, is that something that's reflected in the DevTools as well, like in the timeline? Yeah, exactly. So if I just turn this on, I'm not touching anything, right? It's just like paint, wow. paint, 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 paint. Uh, so there's no reason that you would need this as a, as a user, certainly. Um, but as a developer, you're able to just replicate um, heavy painting situations repeatedly. And this enables you to try some things out. So. I'll actually, you know what? I'll try and keep this this uh, timeline on, and I'm going to come over to Elements. Uh, I'm going to select this image, and I'm going to turn off this uh, CSS gradient, and I'm going to turn off this uh, background size and this box shadow. Now I'm going to come back to timeline, and yeah, that should be a big dramatic difference. <laughs> nice. So we go from pretty um, pretty long paint sizes. Uh, down to uh, very short ones. Um, and overall, in the top right, we have this paint rate meter, which is telling me the million, uh, right now I'm painting about 220 million pixels per second. Um, but uh, when I have, uh, let's see, all the costly effects on, that dives down to about 35. Um, so. This is a pretty big jump from 35 to about 220. So we're able to identify exactly, just by toggling things on and off, um, what's contributing to paint time. So maybe it's individual styles. Maybe it's large. Um, in a lot of websites, there's a, a very large div with a box shadow around it. And you can kind of toggle things off, um, apply display none or visibility hidden to them, um, see what the result is um, in this mode or over in timeline uh, paint length. And help I and then identify what where this is going. In the future, there might be something like a report, a profiling report, where we can identify by element, by style, what's contributing to paint. It's a little tricky because these things are additive, um, but for now, this is a great tool to identify um, uh, what is going on. How's that sound? That sounds pretty cool. Cool.
Um, so, Addy, so do you see like yeah. when people are developing applications that are complex and have rich animations, do you see them actually like making perhaps design decisions based on you know what some of this is reporting back? Yeah, so it's a little tricky, right? Because <sighs> so clearly the fastest situation here is just get rid of box shadow, get rid of CSS gradients and and box uh, uh, background size, etc. Um, if you don't have any CSS, it's going to be really fast. Um, but that's not feasible. So there's a few ways to deal with this. Um, so in diagnosing long panes, like I said, we can just display none to remove it out of the geometry of the page, and it won't contribute to layout at all. If we visibility hidden it, it won't contribute to paint. So we can just toggle entire elements off and on like this. Um, we measure it with either a timeline recording, like I, like I showed, or this new experimental mode, which we hope to be able to share in a public build soon. Um, and then just identify and iterate. Now, if there is a situation like you're asking about where it is bad, and what do you do? You can remove styles. You can try and simplify some of the styles. Maybe you don't need a 60-pixel uh, blur on your box shadow with like uh, 0.2 alpha, and you could actually just change it to be a little bit smaller and, and harder alpha. Um, talk with your designer and identify a, a different sort of a, um, an interaction. For instance, like let's say we had a modal alert coming up. Now, I can't imagine a situation where you would have like you would animate a box shadow from like being really big into small, like, and that would look cool. Um, but a much faster way of doing this is doing a, a 2D transform with um, translate um, just to kind of like scale it in from the top right and kind of like have a little bit of bounce. Um, that's going to sit on the GPU, be really, really fast. So there's some situations where you can kind of work with your designer to find a new style of interaction that works a lot better. Um, and lastly, I know this is not cool at all to say, but um, you can use images instead of using CSS. Um, oh my god. I said it. That was terrible. Um, so um, gradients or box shadow, um, border, imi border image, border image can work. Um, so look into it. I, this is not like a guarantee that images are always faster than CSS, but it's something that you want to try out, especially if you're measuring things and identifying that these are your bottlenecks, um, and this is p possibly something to fix. Um, you always want to measure before and after to identify, is this really worth it? Maybe not. Yeah, so that's that's essentially what we can do. Um, Addy, can you can you talk a little bit about um, the another part of the the timeline that I didn't get to? Sure. So we're going to be talking about memory mode, right? So ta Paul talked about um, events and he talked about frames, but memory mode is really cool because it gives you an overview of your application's memory usage over time. It can help you like diagnose whether you know some of the initial symptoms about whether you might have a memory leak. So Paul's just opened up a little demo application we have, and we're going to switch over to the memory pane. Now this this application is like quite simple. Uh, the idea is that you scroll through it, and it you know will keep displaying new images, and when you click on an image, um, it'll display like a, a larger version of it. So let's, we've got a, like a clear timeline. Let's record a new session and perform some actions. So as you can see, our timeline is populating. Can we click on some of those images just yeah, to see what impact go. that has? Awesome. Let's stop that. So cool. Um, again, in the top view, you've got your summary view. And in the bottom, you've got a details view. And in the summary view, you'll notice that memory usage in increasing as you move between the different parts of your applications. The library area represents the amount of memory uh, being used by your app at a particular time. And the remaining white area represents the total amount of allocated memory that you've got. And this is quite normal. Like This type of um, curve is actually quite normal, because um, garbage collection is going to be happening during the course of all of the interactions. And V8 the JavaScript engine being used by Chrome, um, is going to be running rounds of garbage collection when your app is idle. Now, um, taking a look at the details view, which is the one at the very bottom, we, we can see we've got some sort of curve. Now, a few cycles after garbage collection, um, ideally, your memory profile, so, so that curve, should be going a little bit flat. 
And if it's constantly going up between different garbage collection cycles, you might have a memory leak. That's a problem. Um, now going back to the summary view at the very top, um, another way that you can tell that there might be a problem is if you see a sawtooth. Now that basically represents the cost of doing business in your app. So let's say that you are using you know, request animation frame. Um, that might give you a little bit of garbage. But it's the steepness of your curve that you need to keep an eye on. Because um, if that curve is really steep, it means that you're generating a lot of garbage. Similarly, in the details view, if you've got a stub function, that is also a sign that you might have a memory leak. Um, and on the next episode, we're going to be talking you through a tool called the Heat Profiler. that will actually help you use some of this information to go and dig down and find out exactly what is causing the memory leak and how you can go and you can fix it. Now one thing that I, I missed out on, um, if we go back to timeline very quickly and take a look at the left, is there are three uh, pieces of information on the left. We've got the document count, the DOM node count, and the event listener count. Now the DOM node count shows the number of created DOM nodes um, that are still being held in memory. And the others represent the same for your event listeners and your document instances, like your iframes. Um, and the timeline view allows you to filter down on these. So if you wanted to, for example, just display the DOM node counts, um, you could just deselect the other options, as Paul has just shown you. But yeah, just like any of the other panels, you can um, select a range in your summary view and drill down to um, more specific pieces of information. And hopefully, on the next episode, we're going to show you how you can take this information that might suggest you have a memory leak and actually help you fix it. Nice. OK. Um, so one last thing I just want to show real quick, um, which is that um, for all these things, we can improve the situation, especially on you know, this machine. This is a very recent machine. Um, and I can get 60 FPS, uh, or I could kill my memory leaks. But what about on a mobile situation? Um, now, let's, let's handle that. So I want to show this real quick. Um, so what I have uh, on my phone right here is I have an instance of New York Times Skimmer um, uh, running on Chrome on Android. And uh, I also have uh, my Chrome here connected to remote uh, debug that instance. Uh, looks like. I need to refresh this. Hey, come back. There we go. Nice. All right, so now I'm remote debugging uh, my Chrome on Android. Um, and what I'm going to do is very similar to before. Oh, it's this guy. You might not be able to get to see this, unfortunately. I imagine it looks very cool. It looks so cool. Oh. All right, here we go. Great. So I'm navigating. Um, it's a little hard to see on this situation, but I'm just navigating the, the sections up and down before like I was uh, on the desktop. And we're able to see um, down here uh, a similar situation. But uh, the difference is that um, what the events actually show is that uh, whereas before, remember, I had that very long uh, sequence of parse events that, was, that took, took about 60 milliseconds on desktop. Um, on a mobile situation, that exact same sequence is taken around 250 milliseconds. So um, it gives you a little bit of context as far as uh, even though you, you take care of an optimization on desktop, you really have to think about what the cost is here on mobile. And I'm really excited about um, these tools telling a much richer story about um, how exactly uh, things are, are taking, uh, what are your costs and expensive operations on a mobile device uh, where the story is much more different than what you're used to on desktop. Um, so I guess, again, to wrap up, um, Timeline gives a great overall view of the picture and allows you to dive into exactly what is causing you costs. Um, a lot of these features that I showed um, and that Eddie showed are in the Canary version of Chrome that can run side by side with Stable. We recommend trying that out. Um, 
and uh, but they're making their way to stable very quickly. Um, and so that's about it. Awesome. Great. So just take a look at the questions we got real quick. Yes. Uh, Tune to Siraj from New Delhi asks, uh, some features in CSS3 are still developing, and they're slow. If request animation frame is used, will it affect the performance map? So what was the last the last part of that? If request animation so uh, if request animation frame is used instead, will it affect the performance of map? Ah, yes. Um, good question. So um, you're probably used to, um, yeah, there's a great answer to this. Um, you're probably used to doing something like uh, animating with jQuery um, an element from left to right. And so you'll grab the element of jQuery, and you'll say animate, and like give it a, a pixel offset, and say give it a speed. And so what that is actually doing is just running a set timeout loop um, to operate about every 10 milliseconds um, to uh, just change the inline style. Now, instead, um, you can use something like requ the jQuery request animation frame plugin that just swaps in kind of the animation internals. It was written by a jQuery uh, core development um, team member. Um, it swaps in kind of the animation internals to use request animation frame instead. Um, the impact that this has is pretty significant. Um, with a 10 millisecond set timeout, which is how jQuery normally does it, um, you end up missing frames. Uh, so if we're shooting to have a new frame available to the GPU um, 60 times a second, um, giving uh, the browser something new every 10 milliseconds does not synchronize up well with um, it ex the, the screen expecting 60 changes per second. Um, and so about half of the frames that jQuery is generating by way of setting an inline style never even make it to the screen, um, which is bad. You're doing all the work, and, and the user's not getting the payoff. Um, and so uh, things can be a lot less smooth. So always use request animation frame anytime you're doing, certainly if you're doing Canvas or WebGL, but if you're doing any sort of um, DOM animation, like changing inline styles, um, and if you're doing any scrolling parallax uh, situations where as you scroll, um, things, you know, positions are kind of changing and things uh, popularly these days, uh, this is also another great um, case to use request animation frame to send up new updates to the screen rather than putting it all inside a single uh, on-scroll handler. Um, and so that's basically the best way to handle that situation. Cool. And we'll be sure to share the link to jQuery request animation frame after the show for anyone who wants to check it out. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining. And see you next time. See you next time. Bye.